know the most about the infamous killer known as the Blackwood of Las Vegas? Michael Fleeman wrote a book about Margaret Rudin and her passionate yet stormy marriage and relationship with her millionaire husband, Ron Rudin, before he was brutally murdered in 1994. This is the most of our interview from him as we traveled to his Los Angeles home in this digital exclusive. What, what interested you about this case? You wrote a book 20 years ago. Uh, if I die. Uh, what was so engrossing about this? The Ron Rudin murder had everything that you would want in a true crime story. You had two very charismatic, interesting figures at the central part of the story, but you had obsession, you had betrayal, you had money, you had a mystery, you had humor, believe it or not. There was a farcical element to this entire case. You had every single element that makes for a good true crime story. So from a contextual background, yeah. Las Vegas, we're going to set the scene here, <clears throat> mid-90s. Uh, what was the flavor of the city from what you've been able to kind of gather from what was going on in the city? What was yeah. the vibe of it? What was kind of going on? Las Vegas in the mid-1990s was settling into the Las Vegas that we know today. It's sort of dangerous mob past was well in the rearview mirror. It had now started to become more of the corporate, family-friendly, mega resort sort of destination place. And it, it, it wasn't the, the, the dangerous Las Vegas of old, yet still there were vestiges of that. There were still old mobsters around. There were still some of the old made men uh, from Las Vegas's, uh, you know, more tawdry days were still in town. But it was pretty much the corporate adult Disneyland that it is today. There was this this uh, very, it seemed like influential, even affluent uh, guy, Ron Rudin. He ran mm -hmm. his real estate company yeah. there. Um, had several wives, and then he met this woman by the name of Margaret Rudin. How was she different than maybe his past relationships? <laughs> Margaret Rudin, his fifth wife, was actually very similar to his previous four. She even looked a lot like some of his previous wives. Ron had a type. Um, she was pretty. She was blonde. She was outgoing, vivacious, very sociable, dressed nicely. Um, and she was just the kind of woman that he had always been looking for, never could make it work with them, and she was just the latest in a long line of Ron Rudin types. My next question, Mike, is about yeah. the relationship. What do we know about the relationship between... Um, Ron and Margaret. The relationship between Ron and Margaret was very passionate and very stormy almost from the very beginning. So they loved each other passionately but they had these very very volatile fights. A fight at one point in which there was gunfire, literally a gun emerged, it went off, nobody got shot, but that's how volatile this relationship was. There was a lot of obsession, there was a lot of distrust, there was a lot of suspicion, there was a lot of jealousy, but they were also very, very close at the same time. And so things were on again, off again. They were separated for a while. Mm -hmm. There was divorce proceedings that were on and then they were yeah. off and then she moved back in and it was a big uh, kind of back and forth roller coaster as you described exactly. it. Um, and she did also. Um, I guess my next question will go to when we're all set mm -hmm. here is going to be... Um, I mean, the fight, the gunfire fight is relevant because they got into this huge argument. A gun emerges, it goes off, bullet hits a picture of a seascape or a landscape or mm -hmm. something. That gun re-emerges a very, at a very, very important point in the case. Um, so their relationship and the volatility of the relationship helped solve the case later on. Um, what was the, the point in which that there was no turning back? It seemed like there was a, a point that maybe there, <clears throat> it was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, Ron Rudin always had a wandering eye and he always had an alcohol problem. Well, his wandering eye developed into a full-fledged affair and Margaret found out about it. But Margaret wanted Ron's money and she knew from her previous four marriages that if she gets a divorce, she's not going to get very much of that money. So she stayed with him for a while, but it just got worse and worse and worse and he was literally sleeping with another woman and she found out about it. So she was just gonna hang in there long enough to get 
some money from him. He was helping her set up an antique store, and then she was going to figure out a way to end the marriage. So now we get to the point where he's now missing. It's now yeah. December of 1994. He's been missing, but according to what I've read and, and people have told yeah. me that she wasn't necessarily overly concerned about his disappearance no. while his co-workers, he was very regimented, yeah. showed up on time. Uh, the, the concern that they had, as well as the police did, is that Margaret really didn't show a lot of concern yeah. or emotion that her husband was missing. No. Ron Rudin was a creature of habit. He always came to work at exactly the same time. He even wore the same stuff every day. He wore all black. He was very kind of regimented. He had a military background. So when he didn't show up to work that morning at exactly the right time, his coworkers were terrified. They, they knew something had to have happened. But Margaret, on the other hand, didn't seem very concerned. Or like There were warning signs that, that yeah. Ron kind of knew something wasn't right. And in fact, you, you mentioned it in the book here yeah. that you know, he had his, his will changed to yeah. specifically name her and then not name her. Talk to us about some of the maybe the more alarming red flags that there were that even well, Ron recognized. Yeah. Ron recognized very early some red flags in this relationship. He had been married four times before. He had been around the block four times and he saw things were not working out. Their arguments were huge. A gun goes off during one of their arguments. Then they would make up and then they would fight again and he would you know commiserate to his friends about this. It got to the point that he started worrying that his life could be in danger, that maybe Margaret might elevate this to the next step. So he changed his will. He put a little writer in his will that said, if I die by violent means, car crash, accident, shooting, investigate the person who stands to inherit my money and don't let that person get any of my money if they are found guilty. Now, he didn't mention Margaret by name in the If I Die writer, but most people interpreted that to mean Margaret Root. And then just weeks before his death, he had made a phone call, I think, to John Ruther, who we interviewed, his best yeah. friend, and said something, it was to the effect of, this one worries me, or this one concerns yeah. me kind of thing. Um, and, and they spoke about how they had found that Margaret had some kind of piece of paper that was like, like subdividing his money. Which... Yeah, I can't remember if he found that or if they found that later. I can just say, Margaret was, well, I can start by saying, Ron had been married four times before. Uh, three ended in divorce, one ended in suicide. So he had been around the block. He knew what a troubled marriage, what troubles with a wife was all about. This one, Margaret, particularly worried him. And he told his friends, you know, I'm, I'm especially worried about her. And it later turned out that near the end, Margaret was like totaling the assets and how much she stood to get if he died. The police started to have their suspicions. Um, what were the suspicions or the, the items that were kind of concerning for police? And, and they questioned Margaret. Yeah, repeatedly. yeah. She kind of came up with some theories, the mob otherwise. Yeah, I mean, he hadn't used his credit cards. He hadn't gone to the bank. You know, he hadn't been arrested. He hadn't ended up in any uh, emergency rooms. He was an older guy, had a heart condition. So that was unusual. I mean, people can disappear, but they usually leave some kind of trail. Um, so the fact that he just disappeared off the face of the earth was unusual. And as they were talking to Margaret, she offered some theories. Um, he was involved in these big multi-million dollar real estate transactions. He had uh, foreclosed on people. He had often, you know, held the paper and loaned the money. So there could be disgruntled, you know, uh, loan clients. Um, there might be some connection to the mob. Remember, there were still a few mob figures lingering in Las Vegas. And, you know, he dressed in black. He carried a gun everywhere he went. He always carried lots of cash. He had a big black Cadillac. You know, he, he, he struck a very kind of dark and sinister um, image so that he would have mob connections involved in money or whatever would not be surprising even in the 1990s. And so it's now 1995 mm -hmm. um, and some fishermen uh, from Nellis Air Force Base yeah. go out. They are coming back up a trail and they make <clears throat> this kind of really gruesome discovery. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was that discovery from, from what they were able to, to tell police? These fishermen, they were night fishing at Lake Mojave, and so they're trudging across the desert from the parking lot to the 
lakeshore and they come across what looks like kind of a barbecue pit, a little fire pit. And they just have flashlights. It's the middle of the night. It's quiet. You know, it's very remote out there. And, and they shine the flashlight down and they see a skull. This wasn't just a barbecue pit. This was a place where human remains were burned. And so obviously they freak out and they drive to get to the next phone. No cell phones in those days. And they call police. And so the, the guys who were investing in this case, um, Phil Ramos and Jimmy Vaccaro, yeah. they get the call, they go out there, and this is the break that they were looking for. Without this, this, this yeah. would not have come together. Yeah. Until this point, nobody knew what happened to Ron Rudin. And they didn't entirely know if this was Ron's remains or not. They were kind of sifting through the ashes, looking at the bones, but then lying on a rock next to these human remains is a bracelet. And in jewels, it's written R-O-N, a great big billboard, practically advertising the fact that these are Ron Rudin's remains. And so that kind of really got this thing going towards mm -hmm. um, what ended up happening in yeah. the trial that really had theatrics and everything you could yeah. ever imagine with it. Um, let's skip ahead to now, um, uh, Margaret Rudin, it's 1997 now, and she's about to be indicted or has been indicted, yeah. but she goes on the lamb. She's yeah. gone, like, talk about a master of disguise and deception. She became almost like a chameleon where she exactly. just left and she had wigs and all sorts of things. Just, I don't know, the level of, from your perspective, is the level of, of preparation and what she had to do to accomplish this and be gone for, you know, two and a half yeah, years, three yeah. years. No, uh, Margaret was indicted, and the police called her attorney and said, well, we got to come and pick up Margaret to arrest her. And the lawyer says, oh, I don't represent her anymore, and I don't know where she is. And she goes on the lam for more than two years, and she wears wigs and disguises. She bought books and how to disguise yourself. She even was recognized when she was in Arizona. America's Most Wanted TV show did a segment on her, and she was recognized and they called the police. So not only did she disguise herself, but she was able to use her charm to fool the officer. And, oh, I'm not Margaret Rudin, I, you, you have the wrong person. And he believed her, that's how close she came. So she stayed on the run for more than two years. She ends up living with a guy in Massachusetts under an assumed name, wigs, new look, all this sort of stuff, and just begins a whole new life completely out in the open. So she gets discovered, the cops pick her up, she was found cowering, yeah. I believe, in a bathroom from yeah. the accounts that I hear. She's now, you know, in front of camera, she's handcuffed, she's now being, yeah. you know, fighting extradition back to Las Vegas. She finally gets back and now, I guess the trial has now begun and she is now suspecting number one and we're now in, in the throes of this, this, yeah. this trial. Uh, what were some of the more interesting or unusual things about this trial that went on for nine weeks? Yeah, it was almost t 10 weeks. And for a while, I think it was the longest trial in Las Vegas history, longest criminal trial. Um, it was a circus. There's no other way to describe it. Um, her attorney, Michael Amador, um, a private attorney, very respected in Las Vegas at the time, former prosecutor, um, was basically doing the case pro bono, as a lot of prominent attorneys will do in a high-profile case. And there were problems. There were problems with Michael Amador's defense of her. And things were a little unusual in the beginning. Um, some of the pretrial hearings were a little strange, but nothing out of the ordinary in a, in a you know, case like this. Mm -hmm. But everybody got concerned at opening statements, when Michael Amador stood in front of the jury and was completely unprepared. He clearly had not written out the opening statement. If he had, it wasn't there. He even told the jury, well, I wrote one, but I threw it away. It's just something I do. I mean, anyone who's ever covered a trial knows that most attorneys, you know, they're very, very careful about what they say and what their first impression is to the jury. And his, his first impression was terrible. And he was disorganized, he was rambling, he was off point. And so the whispers began, what's going on with her attorney? What's wrong? And then as the first couple of witnesses came to the stand, it didn't appear that he was overly prepared. He wasn't bad, he wasn't awful, but 
he wasn't of the caliber that you would expect to see in a case like this. And then at one point, Judge Bonaventure reprimanded him, um, and and there was talk from Margaret that she wanted to fire him. That she wanted. Well, she wanted. Else. Yeah, she wanted. There came a point in the trial, and everyone was wondering what's wrong with Michael Amador. And Margaret speaks up, and, and she has a very soft voice, speaks with a southern accent. She's from Tennessee, and she said, Your Honor, uh, I would like a mistrial on the grounds of incompetent counsel, ineffective counsel. And there was an entire hearing about whether or not Michael Amador was competent enough to continue and whether there should be a mistrial. Now, the judge, in a very long and well thought out ruling, um, decided not to grant the mistrial let it continue. Uh, it's very hard to get a mistrial for ineffective counsel. You're not guaranteed perfect representation in America, uh, but you are expected to have effective, competent counsel. And the judge said, you know, maybe it's not the best, but it falls well within the legal guidelines. Um, I, you know, the joke was always that Michael Amador was so ineffective, he could not even effectively argue his own incompetence. He argued for a mistrial on the grounds that he himself was not prepared. And the judge denied it and let the trial go on. Um, the judge did bring in a couple of other attorneys, um, very high profile attorneys in Las Vegas who helped um, Michael Amador out, but they came into the case literally midstream. Um, but they were able to catch up very quickly. I think in the end she got, you know, a, a pretty good defense um, and almost a mistrial uh, by hung jury, but um, it certainly wasn't, you know, the dream team. By the time they got to the defense portion of the case, nerves were frazzled, okay? Already had gone through this mistrial motion. Amador just was driving the judge nuts. Um, it was not smooth sailing. The whole thing is on court TV, so the world can see this very, very poorly operated trial, did not reflect well on the judge, the attorneys, the city of Las Vegas. Um, so everyone's nerves were really on edge by the time they got to the defense case. And then the defense stages this reenactment of the murder. They bring in a, like a movie set of Ron Rudin's bedroom. And one of the attorneys is lying down in bed and the other one goes bang, bang, bang with a you know fake gun trying to prove that the blood splatter would not be the way they found it if he was really killed in his bed. And the judge, you know, there was of course an objection from the prosecution because defense attorneys are not allowed to testify. Somebody else has to say. They can't put on a show like this. It's not a school play. And then Bonaventure just erupted. And I think, you know, underneath it all, Bonaventure and Pitaro are longtime friends and almost like frenemies, you know? And I think it was the fact that Bonaventure had so much respect for Tom Pitaro, and Tom Pitaro had so much respect for Bonaventure that they pulled this, you know, antic that the judge felt doubly betrayed. And like, you know, what are you doing? You can't do this in my courtroom. The, the, the trial already is farcical enough, and then you bring in this, you know, high school play. It was, it was a real bizarre moment in the trial. So we'll skip to the end yeah. here. Um, the verdict is being read. The, the jury had done the deliberations. Mm -hmm. They had come back. Um, we now know hindsight that there yeah. was some discord between the jurors. And getting just in, one. Just, just getting one decision. jury, yeah. But yeah. she eventually, it sounds like, uh, changed her tune and came around. Yeah. So now the jury is delivering its verdict and Margaret is now standing. Um, people were taken, some people were surprised, most people maybe not, about Margaret's reaction to the verdict. Well, Margaret just showed this steely resolve. There wasn't much of a reaction at all, and that surprised people. Um, she's going away 20 years to life. She's an older woman, you know, I think well into her 50s. Uh, this could be a death sentence for her, yet she shows no emotion. And that struck people as very strange. Uh, so she was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole mm -hmm. after 20 years. Mm -hmm. At the time, I've talked to several people, that seems so far in the future, yeah. so distant. Yeah. No one thought that this day would even come, and now here we are. Yeah. It's, it's, it's coming kind of thing. From your kind of perspective, what do, you, what do you think about that? No, you know, 
When I wrote the book almost 20 years ago, nobody could imagine that we'd be sitting here today talking about the parole of Margaret Rudin. It just seemed like something that would never happen, especially in a murder case. Um, uh, a woman, late middle age, uh, given 20 years to life, uh, many thought that was tantamount to a, a death sentence, that she would die in prison. Um, by all accounts, she was a model prisoner, an activist for other uh, inmates, um, stood up for women inmates and their rights and their conditions in the prison, and even won, you know, a judgment when she complained about the, the conditions and the treatment of, of female prisoners. So um, she made the best of her 20 years, and for that, she gets paroled at the earliest possible moment. We spoken to several people yeah. who are still very connected and intimately involved in, in what happened and the cases and they're still alive and well. So we've spoken to several people yeah. um, who are intimately involved in this case. 20 years later, this woman still drives fear into these people. Is that surprising? Um, Margaret is a contradiction. On the one hand, she's this kindly, soft-spoken grandmother, um, Southern Belle. But to others, she's a cold-blooded killer. I mean, Ron Rudin shot three times in the head, perhaps while he was sleeping. He was stuffed into a trunk, dragged out to the middle of the desert, and set on fire, possibly chopped up to get into the trunk. This is a brutal murder, brutal murder. So people don't forget that. So if they think Margaret Rudin is guilty, they see what they think she is capable of doing. And that is a cold-blooded, violent, awful murder for which she has never confessed or ever professed to have taken any, any responsibility for. So yes, Margaret charms people, but she also scares a lot of people. Margaret is and always was a survivor. She was very good at one thing, and that was bouncing back. She went through five marriages, four ending in divorce, one in the death of her final husband. Um, so she was the master of reinvention, the master of survival. Um, and so I don't think anything she does at this point will surprise anybody. Um, I think the only thing people are surprised about is that she is getting out of prison.